I, I have to say, um, coming to Atlanta to speak at this conference is a little bit like being invited to Socrates' house to talk about philosophy. Uh, to stand up here today and talk about socionomics with Bob and Dave and, and Mark and you know, Alan and Chuck, and it, it's, it's a little intimidating. Um, I would say at the same time, um, as, a, as a team, I am incredibly indebted to all of the assistance from the folks at EWI and the Socionomics Institute. Um, I, I am still very much, I consider myself very much a novice in the space of socionomics. Uh, in March of 2009, I stood in front of a classroom and said, based on what I'd seen in the mortgage space, the mortgage bank space, the banking space, that what was going to happen would be countries next. And I said it you know, with sort of that level of definiteness. And yet, at the time, I had no idea why or how that would happen. That led me to a struggle of economics, philosophy, politics, history, trying to figure out what would happen next and why. And today, I cover the financial services industry and have fully embedded into my coverage the principles of socionomics and the importance of social mood. And some of my clients you know, were a little reluctant, but they've come to realize why. And the next chart, it's a little hard to see black on black, but this is a chart of the Bloomberg Consumer Confidence Index against the BKX, the BKX being the bank broad index. And you can't talk about the banks without understanding that when mood shifts in this environment, bank stocks either take off or fall from the sky. And this is the plot of those two lines from October of last year until today. You had to know what was happening in terms of mood in order to see what was about to happen to bank stocks. It didn't matter about their balance sheets. It didn't matter about their earnings. It didn't matter about liquidity. It was all about when we went from black to white, their stocks were going to take off. So why does mood matter? I've spent a lot of time trying to figure this out for myself. And the, and the where I've come to it is really by analogy. So let me, let me set a, a stage for you. You get on the roller coaster at the bottom and the cars go click, 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 very slowly up to the top. And I don't know who the sadist was who thought it would be fun, but you know, they, they stop the cars at the very top, right? <laughs> you know, just before they plummet to your death, they sit there. And you say, you know, the, the question sort of then becomes, who do you think about in that moment before you fall to your death? Anybody? Who do you think about? You're thinking about a long lost friend, a distant cousin, somebody you know, 60 miles or 60,000 miles away. I've asked, I've asked that question of lots of people in lots of places, and the answer comes back consistently, the only person I care about is me. I don't care about the person sitting next to me, even if that person is my spouse. It's all about me. And then the question is, well, when do you think about? You thinking about next week, next month, that summer vacation that's coming ahead? No. You thinking about the next 10 seconds and you're praying to God that you don't perish in the process. And the final question is, where do you think about? Across the park, across the world? No. You think about me here now. When we are subject to extreme fear, or what I think of as an extreme lack of confidence, we care about one thing, me here now. It's got a physical dimension, a time dimension that are so consistent in our behaviors. From that, I can create a continuum of confidence where as our confidence grows, our world expands. It expands in terms of relationships and time and space. And I put at the top something called, I, I think of this self-assured certainty. And I think of this as sort of a middle school phenomenon. You know, we are certain, and we are certain of being certain. There's a, there's a hubris-filled element to it at the very top. 
And it also picks up our relationships. If it's me when I am most unconfident, it's all of us. And I trust people implicitly. And we don't realize it until things go the other direction. And then I have to scrutinize everything as we become more stress-filled. We, we behave with this notion of me here now trying to get things to us everywhere forever. I saw this in the economic recovery where the Federal Reserve and policy makers, makers said, we need to do something to get confidence back. And so what did they do? They focused on the biggest banks, the biggest corporations, the, the folks that had you know, wherewithal, if we fix them, they will help everybody else. I call it the, the oxygen mask policy response. You know, you get on the airplane, put the mask on first. When you've got enough air, put it on your kids. That was the approach that we took. For those who live in a nominal world, there's been a great boost in confidence. But for the real world, which is what this next chart shows, you have two very distinct experiences. Mood reflected by the S&P being significantly higher for those who exist in the nominal world, and for the rest of us, it's that red line. Bob has used this chart, I've used this chart a lot. This is the S&P plotted against the Consumer Confidence Index with the S&P plotted in gold. Somehow we feel, in real terms, the same. 2000 was us everywhere forever. And you saw it in our behaviors, in our actions. You know, there, everything that you can capture in strong confidence gets picked up. Interconnectedness, just-in-time inventory, you know, multinational, if not transnational corporations. And my favorite being concept stocks. I mean, to me, nothing says us everywhere forever than the valuations we put into companies that had no revenue, that had barely a good idea. In fact, at the extreme top, I have a friend who says she was approached by people to put money into a company that then would go out and hire people that they thought would have a good idea. It was that level of confidence that we had, us everywhere forever. Since then, you can start to track the deterioration in confidence in a pullback of our behaviors. And we can debate whether, you know, up or down, you know, where would you put the midpoints? But there's no question that between the dot-com bubble and 2008, our world shrank. I've done this presentation a number of times and asked people, when was it that we felt best? Consistently, the answer comes back 2000, or my favorite answer being sometime before September 10th, 2001. We just kind of know that. When I shared this slide with Dave Allman on a conference call, he stopped me and he said, hold on a second, I'm going to send you the next slide. I was like, okay. And he sent me this one. Hard to see. If you're an Elliott Wave subscriber, you've seen this before. This looks at valuations of, of stocks based on price to book and bond yield to stock yield. That red line is the 2000 to 2008 same, same migration. That same pattern that we saw here captured there. And the more I've thought about it, the more it makes sense to me that as our confidence deteriorates, we are less willing to value stocks. You know, forward earnings, price, price earnings ratios, clear measures of our level of confidence in the future and the depth and certainty of that confidence being measured in multiples. Today, we live in what I call the me here now world. It's an incredible contrast to what we had in 2000. You know, we're renting things. I love the fact that the word transitory just sort of lands into the, the vernacular. You know, things that are extremism. We've gone from just in time inventory to just in case inventory. And what do we love? We love dividend stocks, not concept stocks. Uh, you can even take it down to another level. The logical business opportunities, and this is sort of a 2011, 2012 scenario. 
Nothing to me says me here now like Facebook. Or I think uh, my friends back there would say, no, 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 it's not just Facebook, it's Twitter. Sort of an extreme me here now, even faster. But you could throw on top of it Apple and all of its iProducts. You know, you talk about technology that so fit with a shrinking sense of, of, of the world. I want my video, my phone, you know, I has become my. And even things like Keurig. You know, forget the, the company coffee pot. My cup of coffee for me right now. And you see it in things like pawn shops and multifamily housing, microbreweries, farm to table, the whole locavore movement, where somehow we ascribe greater value, greater certainty, greater healthiness to things that are local. You know, I, I get asked a lot covering financial institutions, what's the problem with housing? The problem with housing to me is this slide. We've gone from an environment where people thought they had permanent wealth to where they perceive they have temporary income. And it frustrates the regulators. This is a set of slides that Elizabeth Hunt, one of the Fed governors, used uh, back in January. And she was lamenting the fact on the, on the left side that housing affordability is you know, at a record high. And yet, I can't explain the, the dark line on the right-hand side, which is rents. How can these go together? They go together in an environment like this. We will rent until the cows come home. And you, and you see it in other products. You see it in Hulu. You see it in you know, Netflix. You know, this is an environment where you want to be in a subscription basis, particularly one that requires no capital investment. I can, I can look at other things in this sort of an environment. This is a, a slide of sort of capturing the, the sentiment of the EU in 2000. You know, that sense of us everywhere forever and the, the institution of the, the euro and, and the alignment and the increasing you know, number of participants in the eurozone. And yet we look at it in this environment today where you have extraordinary resentment and I can measure that resentment, just tracking the stock gap between you know, Spain and Germany or between Greece and Germany. There's a reason these folks are having difficulty in, in getting along. You know, you've, got, you've got folks that are in a me-here-now world. And clearly, if I then look at you know, the, that lower left-hand corner, that's a, that's a toxic place. That's a world of sacrifice. I was talking to, to Mark at, at lunch. You know, you, you think about the, the uh, Arab Spring. Those are moments that are created in that lower left-hand corner. Me, here, now. I must do something to change the future. To me, the, the entire resolution of the EU is a function of the direction of the DAX. Because generosity reflects the confidence of the donor, not the need of the recipient. If Germany's confidence increases, Germany will provide assistance. If German confidence deteriorates as measured by the DAX, that system has no hope whatsoever. I get involved in, in talking to investors about well, you know, Peter, this is all bad news, so, so what do I do about it? You know, there's some opportunities that arise from, you know, what I think of as how do you capitalize on the me here now world? One of them is clearly in the financial services space as financial institutions retrench. And they're retrenching because their businesses have become overwhelmingly complex and they're retrenching because of the imposition of nationalism and what I call the politicization of credit. Governments will be involved in dictating how capital is allocated and the scarcity of capital that comes from an environment of, of lower left, of me here now. Same thing with global deleveraging. This is, this is why having capital to deploy is so important. Because as mood shifts and we get to points of, of greater and greater lack of confidence, it, 
It's a need for equity in as opposed to equity out transactions. We talked a little bit about the rental renaissance. I am a little concerned that multifamily is beginning to look pretty frothy. I think we all are very aware of the, the rental renaissance in, in housing. But you know, there's plenty of other opportunities in the subscription face. And, and I think anything to do with the LOCA movement, and LOCA here being really translated to nationalistic application of, of commerce. And I'll come back to that point. And again, anything to do with the just-in-case movement. You know, it's not just inventory. When I talk to clients, this is a chart that I use often, which is to say, what if from 1932 to today, or you know, the last 10 years, has really been nothing but a full cycle from depths of depression, an extreme in me here now, to an opposite extreme. And what does that then mean from a 5, 10, 15 year time horizon? But I also think, and this is sort of an overlay in terms of valuations, we've also seen over this period of time an extraordinary metamorphosis of the nature of corporate entities those entities that are really emblematic of the entire investment process that is caught up in our big indices. You know, to look at the S&P 500 today is to look at an index that is truly transnational. These are not American companies. These are companies of the world. And I think that in an environment where we're moving upper right, you know, us everywhere forever, they benefit, we benefit. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful kumbaya state between politics and business and social aspects. And I mean, it all creates, to me, it's the wealth effect. But as I look at the commercial space today, these companies are terribly ill-equipped to handle the imposition of mounting nationalism. And what does it mean in terms of revisions of their models? I would pay very close attention to the financial services space. You know, I, I believe there is no industry more sensitive to mood than the financial services space. So when I see banks like HSBC pulling back or, or banks like ING being forced to sell foreign operations because of local, you know, local government demands, I can't help but wonder, is that a coming attraction to what will be demanded of big, large, transnational corporations? Go back and read what the New York Times had to say about Apple in a cover story about outsourcing and the political overtone of you know, what does that mean for domestic US jobs and the rebuttal from Apple. That's not our problem. In a world of us everywhere forever, it's not. But I can tell you as mood moves lower left, it sure is going to be for political leaders and for folks looking for jobs on Main Street. When I talk to clients, these are the risks that I focus on. These are the realities that come with lower left, lower stock valuations, whether we want them or not. I don't wish for them, I don't hope for them, but me here now makes these clear consequences. And so for those who are in business, I focus on make sure you're paired. I said to a, the CFO of a Fortune 50 country, do you have local leadership? Do you have you know, capital, goods, services, data? on a local basis? Could you run what today is a hub and spoke to 219 countries I believe they operate in? What happens when those cords get cut and you have to stand alone in Europe? And they don't think like that. Same thing with liquidity. And certainly I think the overtones for corporate leaders looking at the legislative space making sure there is alignment because national interest will trump corporate interest 
if mood continues to deteriorate and we see even greater and greater extremes of me here now.